Hey everybody, Countdown More VHS here. Today we're taking an overdue look at Scanza Total War. This is a relatively new mod for Rome Total War Barbarian Invasion, but it has been in the works for a long time indeed. Uh, this has about as long of a development life as 4th Age Total War Dominion of Men, so we're looking at something like 14 or 15 years. And this is the product of almost entirely uh, one man's work, I believe, Dansk Viking, as he goes by on the Total War Center forums. And I'm going to have some links in the description here so you can check out the, those threads. You can find the ModDB page to check, check this out yourself. Uh, but it's great to see that he's finally got a public release here. I know that there's been a ton of love research sweat, blood, tears, all the rest of it poured into this. And so I thought we could jump in today and take a look. So the first thing to notice about this mod is that it focuses geographically and chronologically on this particular place, this particular time. And I, I really like mods with small scopes. This has always been something of interest to me from when the first expansion for Medieval Total War came out, Viking Invasion. We got a smaller map or blown up map of, uh, of England and Ireland and Scotland. And so we were able to take a closer look at those periods instead of the the more typical experience of a grand campaign where taking over a country can be a matter of one or three or four battles uh, with a map of this scale you can expect a lot smaller scope for your factions I find that really interesting myself it means that there's a, sort of a bit more of a struggle to work yourself up to the status of a regional power and that means of course that we have room for lots of factions now if you are a history buff you will have heard of many of these uh, I count myself as somewhat of a history buff in, in the sense that I do have a, a great interest and love for like old English literature. And so I'm familiar with some of these names. For example, the Frisians, really nice to see them here. If you've read Beowulf, for example, you're going to know that the, uh, the, the Frisian slaughter makes an appearance in that poem. And uh, Finn, of course, is referenced in Beowulf. And so here you get to play uh, his father, Folkwald. Uh, you also can play as Saxons. Uh, the men of Hordeland, uh, the West Geats. There's various flavors of Geats, Jutes, Saxons, Angles, everything in between. Uh, what you won't find is a ton of factions in the Baltic regions. Again, the scope of this mod is primarily here. You will find settlements here, but I believe they're mostly rebel-held. That's fine as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how you would even represent some of these factions, but it, suffice it to say, there's been a ton of research put in here. And even the descriptions of the factions themselves are really, uh, really atmospheric and, and very interesting. Uh, there's sort of a heroic focus on this mod where you get the, these names that are just sort of hinted at in the genealogies and histories and, and old epic poems from long ago. And uh, even a name like Arendel, which is something you, you know, something out of Tolkien, obviously. Uh, you can see where some of that influence came from because, of course, Tolkien himself was a scholar of Northern European history. Now, my understanding is that one of the main features of Dansk's work and research was on getting the map to be as accurate as possible. If you remember the vanilla map for Barbarian Invasion and remember this Scandinavian region, you may remember how disappointing it was in that there was it was a single region, right? This was one province controlled with a settlement uh, in modern-day Denmark. And so you could easily imagine how someone, you know, back in 2004 or whenever uh, Barbarian Invasion came out would be rather disappointed with that setup and might even go crazy enough to devote the next decade and a half of his life to developing a mod with a lot more detail. Because this does, of course, focus on essentially that same period of time, the, the Barbarian Invasion migration period, if you will. And that uh, itself plays a major role with the scripting and the flow of this particular campaign. So let's take a look at the campaign map. We'll jump into a, uh, a faction right at the beginning of its life, so to speak, and then we will look at a campaign in progress and see how the battles look and see how the campaign plays out. So when you load up a campaign, in this case we've selected the angles, you're going to be greeted, of course, with this script notification. This is one of those mods that has scripts that occur throughout the course of the campaign, which means, as you are no doubt used to, you are going to have to select, uh, to activate the background script when loading a save game, typically by selecting a settlement or an army or anything. It's not that difficult, but it is something to kind of keep in mind. What do the scripts do in this mod? Well, my understanding is they affect the migration, they affect population, public order and things as the seasons progress. So currently we start in 391 AD in the summer. And if we open up the message that has popped down, it gives us a bit of information about those mechanics. Essentially, we're in the migration period 
but we are a sedentary people. Of course, we're not a horde faction, none of the factions in this mod are, and so what we need to do, in a way, is minimize the migratory impulse of the people we are trying to control. The goal in this mod, like in many Total War games, essentially, is to build up a realm, to build up your power, and you can't do that if your best fighting men are going off to, you know, raid England every summer. So what we want to try to do is counteract the effects of that migratory impulse. Essentially, what this means is, for the mod, we have migratoriness uh, expressed as a religion. Uh, if we take a look at, for example, any settlement here, like our capital, and if we look at the settlement details, we can see that there's a breakdown of belief. Now, in Rome Total War and Barbarian Invasion, you have religion. Well, I guess religion came in with Barbarian Invasion itself. Religion, which plays a role and is expressed through the various buildings, through characters, uh, and I think those are the main two ways. Here we can see that we're feeling pretty good. We've got a 70% sedentary uh, culture here, and we've got 30% migratory. So there is a bit of a public order problem because people are anxious to get out, anxious to get looting, Viking, if you will. Um, but we can't really do too much about this. To some extent, it is due to the whim of the seasons or, or other factions. And in fact, one of the things that you can do to disrupt your neighbors, and one of the things you'll have to deal with yourself, is enemy agents coming into your territory who are migratory, who have that migratory uh, you know, religion, if you will. They're going to be increasing this component of your settlements, and that is going to be essentially encouraging your people to leave, encouraging unrest in your cities. So you have to manage that by building buildings, by making sure that your own agents are countering the, the impulses of, uh, of those of your, your rivals. But to some extent, it's going to be just something that you will have to, to live with. You won't be able to eliminate this entirely as the campaign goes on. And in fact, in some cases, buildings will hurt you. If you look at the market line or the trader line of buildings, once you get up to the second tier town markets, you'll be seeing a negative to the sedentary conversion rate of your settlement. So in other words, more traders coming in is going to kind of increase the migratory influence of your lands. Sort of makes sense. People are getting stories of these men from over the sea and uh, getting, getting an itch to go out and plunder on their own. So again, the buildings are going to play a role and you're gonna to have to make some choices potentially. Do I want to live with that bit of unrest, that bit of uh, sort of conversion away from what I would like to be, a sedentary culture? Or do I want to go with, uh, go with the cash that are going to be brought in with town markets as well as the population? And population will be itself an important factor. Uh, at the beginning of the game here, your, your capital as the Angles has about 2,100 a population of freemen. But because we're using the base mechanics in this mod for, uh, for upgrading your settlements, you're going to need to get your population up before you can upgrade those cities. So it's going to be a... Uh, a balance again between upgrading your settlements and maybe not wanting to train too much because you're going to be taking the population directly out of here and slowing your development. However, one of the things you can do is build buildings to help the population and some of the buildings that improve pop growth will also benefit your sedentary uh, nature of your settlements. Those in particular would be the farms. So if you are to go down to the farm line, you'll see that building a common meadow is going to increase the food production, uh, increase population growth directly there, give you some more tax income, and increase the sedentary conversion rate. This is going to, of course, model encouraging your population to stick around and uh, to keep some skin in the game uh, because they have lands to watch out for. These effects are going to increase as you develop further, but of course these are going to become increasingly uh, important and increasingly expensive and time-consuming as you go. I also want to point out that the art for this stuff is really fantastic. I believe Jor was, uh, the incomparable Jor was, was involved with this. Uh, of course he's done a lot of work on a lot of different mods and it's really great to see uh, to see his work here. Everything from the, the large pictures here on the, um, uh, on the settlement details to the, the sort of the smaller icons down below. Really nice stuff. And the loading screens as well really help get you into the atmosphere. In terms of units, you can expect to be doing most of your fighting with infantry. There are some ranged units that are what you would call dedicatedly ranged units, bowmen, archers of various stripes. 
but for the most part you're going to be having guys with spears slugging it out against other guys with spears of various descriptions. One of the things this mod does uh, that's rather interesting is portrays both the overhand and underhand versions of, uh, of spear wielding that you might expect to see. Now apparently there's some sort of controversy ongoing as to which one of these is more accurate. Uh, I'm not going to take a position in that myself. I haven't researched it or anything. But both of those are represented. So, And the way it seems to work is that units who take this overhand stance uh, tend not to have ranged weapons, whereas those who take the under st underhand stance do have a missile attack. Uh, so there's a bit of a distinction there. And, uh, and typically the ones, the ones who can't throw javelins are also going to have a shield wall. This does not mean, though, that you're not going to be doing uh, any interesting tactics. Of course, a lot of the tactics that you would expect from a Total War game are still going to apply. You're going to get some tough guys in the center, maybe shield wall, maybe guard mode, and then work on outflanking and winning the battle on the edges while some skirmishing happens. It's just that you're going to have to do most of the fighting with guys on foot. However, there, av there are cavalry that you can train. Uh, there's certainly stables you can build. And uh, one interesting form of balance that this mod has inherently to it is that a lot of the factions have very similar unit rosters. For some people that may be a bit of a turnoff, but of course it makes sense. I mean, it would be a really strange mod to expect that the Angles had a completely different roster from the, uh, the Jutes, for example. But now that we're at the larger map, we can take a look and appreciate just the size and the sheer scope of this mod. Uh, of course, Scandinavia is the major playground here and there is a ton of real estate for you to conquer. If you want to go for sort of an early uh, North Sea Empire, you can certainly attempt that. It would take you quite some time. And one of the things that I really appreciate is the level of detail put in with the river systems. Dansk Viking seems to have set it up as realistically as possible so that uh, what you read about in terms of trips uh, into the inland regions of Sweden or Norway, up through the river systems into the lakes, stuff you would hear about in the sagas, uh, is actually replicable here to a great extent. Uh, so you can control choke points, you can uh, get your men uh, from one place to another uh, by boat, by foot, in a way that it seems very realistic and reasonable. Because this is a multiple turns per year mod, more than the vanilla game was, uh, you're going to have different effects at different stages of the year. We've ended the turn and here we are still in summer. And so we're getting a notification about the population there. So basically what happens is during the summer months, you're going to be experiencing a loss of population among settlements on the southern North Sea coast as these people head out to raid the shores of Britain, take hires, new mercenaries, etc., etc. We also get a lot of notifications in this case. Uh, we're dealing with a certain amount of unrest. You see, at the beginning of the campaign, you're not going to have a lot of military forces in your settlements. And in fact, many settlements will have very little, if any, infrastructure. So you'll have to devote some time to building those up, making some networks for trade and alliances with your neighbors, and hoping you can hold off those enemies. So what I'd like to do is jump into a campaign already in progress with the same faction and see how we've expanded from our initial position here, uh, sort of in the middle of the Jutland Peninsula. So you can see I've made just a little bit of progress here. So we're in 396 AD. Uh, it's summer. That means five years have gone by. I'm not sure if it's, a f if it's four turns per year exactly. I haven't paid attention to that. Uh, but we f it feels like we're about 20 turns in or so at this point. And I've only conquered a couple of settlements, but we're going to be adding another uh, one or two fairly soon here because we do have some wars going on. This campaign, though, tends to be a fairly slow burn if, like me, you are... Uh, I inclined initially to spend time building up your settlements. I wanted to have a few settlements that could r fairly regularly supply me with troops, but you also want to have some settlements that you're really focusing on growing, those which you can keep the taxes on fairly low and you can avoid training any troops out of so you can help your economy get up. There are a lot of economy-related buildings you can spend. For example, over here, I've got some bog iron extraction going. This is essentially, it works like mining, a fairly uh, flat and steady rate of income. We'll get the scripts kicking back on. Uh, and there are also various levels of shrines to build. If we take a look at the settlement details, scroll for those, uh, you do have some choices to make. There's quite a few of them. All these temples are going to have slightly different effects, and some of them are going to grant you uh, units at the higher levels. So, for example, if we look at the this uh, Wolfes Temple, and I'm not going to get these names just right, 
Uh, we will notice that they give some bonuses to law, happiness, uh, but they do cost some upkeep as you're going to be performing sacrifices, apparently. Uh, that's going to cost a bit of uh, the people's income. Uh, and it does add your conversion. At the second tier, we're going to get a unit, Wolf Theos. And if we can look at those, this is a very interesting, heavily armored bow and sword unit uh, with a, a great sort of, I think it's a Vendel style helmet. Uh, I could be wrong there. Uh, but we've got units with some interesting attributes. A lot of times they're going to come out of the temples. These are going to be units that are more akin to your bodyguards, whereas the units you can train are more typically going to be those, those spear uh, men with lots of men per unit. Uh, however, notice the size of these units, only 32 soldiers, uh, whereas your spearmen, your typical frontline fighters, are going to have a lot more. Uh, the mod seems to take a huge unit size as the default, so we've got 240 soldiers uh, for the churls here, 160s for the fair dutrum, and that seems fairly typical, but that also does mean it's going to be a fairly large strain on your population. In terms of the diplomacy here, I've got myself into war with just one faction, uh, a nearby Danish faction, the uh, the Erilar, and I managed to make some alliances both with the Iotanas to my north and with the Saxa to my south. However, these guys are coming under some trouble. I just recently took this settlement from the Erila, uh, but they had taken it from the Saxons. And I also see that the Frisians are moving in on Saxon territory, so it might be time for me to start a war with them fairly soon. As for our war to the north with the Danes, I think we've got them just down to this one last settlement, unless they have some territory over here. Uh, but we're going to keep this under siege and see if they sally. We can get the battle on, a, on the defense. Uh, their forces, as you can see, are largely similar to ours. Again, that's totally to be expected for the period. They've got a lot of, uh, a lot of spearmen. They do have some higher level thanes, it looks like. But for the most part, these are going to be spears that you throw or spears that you thrust. Uh, their bodyguard unit is a little bit different. This is a, a Theodthanar, and uh, he's a, a very impressive sword and shield bodyguard unit with an eagle to inspire nearby troops. Our bodyguards are a little bit different, uh, Yasithas, and so they don't have the impressive helmet. Uh, they're a little more rough looking potentially, but they're still fairly effective. Uh, there, I should also mention mercenaries. These are going to be uh, rather important as you will want to take the strain off of the population of your cities so you can encourage them to grow. And these mercenaries also often uh, offer some incredible flexibility. So the Rakian is, uh, these are essentially exiles who've been out looking for adventure, looking for plunder, and they're, uh, they're eager enough to sell their services to you for a fairly high upkeep and recruitment cost. Uh, not as many men per unit, but they're going to be quite well armed. Uh, they can do a shield wall, and uh, alternatively, you could get Fardrangir. I guess these are some more travelers, just different types of uh, men traveling around. you got some javelins and spears as well to fight with. Some of these guys are going to have a war cry, some are going to have different levels of morale or armor, but they're all going to be fairly effective in their own way. So let's pass a few turns here and see what trouble we can get into. All right, so now that the Erilar and the Saxa don't share a border, it looks like they're uh, mending fences. That kind of puts me in an awkward position because I've taken some territory that originally belonged to my allies, and so they may want it back fairly soon. As you can tell, my forces here are not particularly strong either. Uh, but we'll see if we can hold on to that and maybe eliminate the, uh, the Erilar before too long if they have any other settlements uh, on other islands. That, of course, may be a problem. We did finish some Chieftain's House construction at Yealinga, and so let's take a look at that. Yeah, so this building has uh, gotten us to the large town level of settlements. This is great. In this settlement, what I want to do is kind of have an all-purpose area where I can train some, some reasonable soldiers to send them quickly into the north, because at some point I do imagine I'll be at war with the Jutes. But we also want to take care to not go too heavily into the military line because there are going to be some negative impacts on, uh, on tax income as a result of that. This does mean, though, that we can now get into uh, some much more variety of, uh, of units. Instead of just getting the typical uh, spearmen, we can also get some archers. Uh, we can get some hearth troops, uh, some churls, of course, and, and these guys I think we could all also get. 
but we are going to be able to get cavalry now as well. Now some of these units are available at different buildings depending on different things. So we could also go straight for the stables uh, to train those guys. Uh, let's take a look at how that would work out. Yeah, so this is going to require a blacksmith. If we had a blacksmith here, we could just get that same cavalry unit after building this stables building. And at a higher level, we would get essentially our mounted version of our bodyguard unit, uh, which is a, a pretty interesting uh, unit with some, some versatility and a certain amount of flexibility, of course. If you're the only guy with cavalry on the battlefield, it makes a big difference. I've also been notified that I have successfully repaired a couple of buildings. Uh, and this is something that, that the mod adds, again, by a script. When you take over a new settlement, you're going to get a couple of buildings that are going to take some damage by default, and you will need to repair them in order to make any use of them. This is to sort of represent you taking over a new territory and needing to deal with any surviving members, let's say, or sort of to assert your own stamp on the province. So we had to rebuild the barracks, we had to rebuild I think the chieftain's house, uh, just to make sure that this is now going to be loyal to us. In terms of economy, we've been doing fairly well. I've been trying to continuously make money, so we've accumulated over 9,000 in the bank, and we're projected to make 3,000 this turn before queuing up any buildings or units, uh, so hopefully that'll only increase. Let's see what we can spend it on now though. I think we want to invest in our capital. I've kept it right here because it seems like a fairly central location. This is where your capital initially is. And I do want to make this a place where we can build up both our economy and our military. Uh, but again, we don't want too many military buildings all over the place because they do have a cost associated with them, an upkeep cost, if you will. And so here, I think what we want to do is keep working up the population level. We have been doing a bit of training out of here, and it's hurt the overall population. So if we're ever going to get up to 6,000, we're going to need to do some stuff. Uh, one thing we could do that's a pretty cheap option is uh, the household cess pit. We can go there. That's going to increase public order and also uh, population growth by a small amount. Taking my spy down to the south, I can see that the Saxons have managed to hold on most of their territory in the area and probably even expand a little from their starting position. Uh, but the Frisians have ended up with some of their territory up here. I'm thinking they possibly took it by naval invasion since there's no other Frisian territory in the region. That would make them a pretty reasonable target for me uh, to take the settlement and then get a ceasefire with them. That would be pretty lucrative. So if I can get together some men, that would be really nice. Maybe then I can afford to do a little bit of training in some of my settlements. Even though the population is going to be hurt, we just upgraded Yealinga, so I think we can afford to train some churls out of there. Now because it is now winter, we're looking at considerably lower profits across our territory. Uh, this again is a result of, of the script. Uh, last season we were looking at, I think, 3,000 uh, projected profits. This, you know, it's, uh, it's a little above half that. So you can expect to see some fluctuation both in the population management as well as in your income. We only have one season remaining on this siege of their, their, uh, the Aralar capital. So hopefully that'll be over uh, pretty quick as they sally out. Oh, indeed, they're going for it. So it looks like we've got a pretty balanced fight ahead of us. Again, really cool art here for the uh, uh, for the for the screen. Now, if we look at the command, this guy certainly out out commands us. But what we can't win by cunning, maybe we can win by sheer numbers of units. Uh, he's got a very uh, very strong looking bodyguard here with some missile attack with uh, with an inspirational eagle standard. But we've got a lot of guys of our own, and we do have some cav. They don't. So let's see how that uh, how that works for us. And yeah, even the loading screens for this mod look beautiful. So again, hats off to the uh, the art department for the mod, which I think is Joar essentially. So as this is a sally battle, I don't really have a lot of time to get everything ready. I'm going to just make sure everyone is on fire at will that can be. And uh, we're going to get some of these guys in a shield wall formation. These are the bodyguard uh, Yasithas. We've got several extra princes here that are going to be uh, playing a pretty large part in this fight. We do have some bowmen, and we've got our own 
tough spearmen in the back here. We've also got some Rakyanaz. Let's take a closer look at these guys. Yeah, these are those mercenary uh, exiles. Very nice standards as well. Nice deer head flag for you. And we've got calves, so I want to make sure that these guys are going to be working in tandem and working around the flanks of the battle. Let's get these guys in a shield wall. Let's see, we can work these units around the right. We should be able to hold off these carls pretty easily. So here you can see that overhand uh, fighting animation. We're losing some of our light infantry, so let's move in with our bodyguard and our other units. And maybe we can get a nice decisive charge in the back of these guys. Oh yeah, we're, we're looking uh, looking pretty hurt. They've got some Lithsmen, they've got some Carls. These are not the best units, but here's also their bodyguard. We can see the well-armored men of the Aralar, so let's do a charge right into them. And we'll get ready to pull out our cav. You can notice that our cavalry is fairly light. We've got javelins, we've got thrusting spears, but they're not going to hold up long in this melee. So I think we're going to pull out now that we're starting to take some losses, and we'll just rinse and repeat. Okay, we've got these uh, Fardranger back. Let's bring them over here. They do have uh, javelins, so we should be able to get them, get them in the fight in a meaningful way pretty soon. You know, I'm thinking these guys are actually probably the the bigger threat. But let's keep doing a few charges. We'll get the Lidsmen, I think, in on this next one. Okay, now they're feeling a bit uh, a bit more more pressed. All right, the few thing are are. It looks like they're regrouping off, off to the side. Let's get my cav out. We're not doing too well with those guys. The other thing we may want to do is get our bowmen around. Uh, since we don't have a lot of mobility with this army, we want to get uh, pretty much everything right in place. And what I've found is that um, I found myself using flaming ammunition a lot more frequently as you use your bowmen not so much to you know to take out the enemy archers in those uh, archer duels but essentially to deliver morale shocks and so that uh, the flaming ammo makes a big difference here I'm gonna get our far dranger on taunt mode we've got them war crying and they've got spears in melee so we'll just uh, charge them right in here we'll get the lidsmen hopefully on the run pretty soon we want to get these guys at a position where, where we can shoot into the backs of a pretty vulnerable unit. I'm not sure if we're going to make that happen, but we'll see. Let's get our cav out. It's going to be a very, very costly battle for us, but this is going to be a pretty important one, too. If we can pull it off, uh, we'll have their capital city and the entirety of this island. All right, it looks like we've won on the left here, so the enemy Dranger are in route. These look like pretty light guys with uh, spears and javelins. We've got a good amount of our churls uh, in, uh, in good formation, and of course our king. All right, we've got our archers around here. Let's put them on that flaming ammo and see what that, uh, that morale shock looks like. Let's get, get some arrows into the back of these carls. Oh, that's right. So they're going to be running back to the uh, central plaza because it's a sally battle for them. All right, so they're panicked by the fire attack, but there are a lot of them left still. I'm going to sort of hold off on this, and we'll focus instead on the enemy king's unit. I don't know how effective their armor is going to be against the uh, the flaming arrows. Hopefully, we'll be able to uh, to deal with them. Looks like we got a heroic death in here, unfortunately. Kurdic. Well, let's make his death not in vain. That's another heroic death. We got a lot of family members biting it here. I think that's just um, 
probably a result of me shooting arrows into the, the melee. That could, could possibly have something to do with these uh, otherwise unexpected deaths. Alright, let's risk like one more. Where's the guy who's left alive? He's over here. We'll do one more volley. We'll charge the cavalry in. Alright, you guys can halt then. The enemy king is down to just 18 companions, so that's that's a lot better. We've gotten him uh, pretty much surrounded at this point, and now it's just a long, slow grind uh, until victory occurs. So maybe we ought to switch our targets over to these Carls. They're a pretty light unit by the look of it. They're, they were wavering a second ago. They got defeat as a distinct possibility. Let's charge in. Let's move the archers over that way, too. enemy bodyguards only got six men left. I think we're in a pretty good position to shoot safely from here with our bowmen. They're exhausted, shaken. A few arrows melting them and may, uh, may cause a rout. Yep, there they go. Uh, let's, uh, that's actually it for our arrows. The other thing is you got to manage your, your ammunition in this. Is not a ton of arrows to go around, so you got to be uh, be kind of careful, which is good, honestly. I don't want to, I don't want to win the battle on my ranged necessarily, but it feels feels fairly tactical in terms of how you can use them. Just a couple of Theodiengar fighting to the death. It'll soon be over, I imagine. And there he goes. His men now fear us. Got a few thanes who haven't uh, realized that the the battle is over yet either. They're fighting to the death. So we got this essentially wrapped up. The enemy flee from the field like frightened goats. Hunt them down and slay them all. I think we can continue the battle just to make sure that we're gonna gonna get the settlement. Although I don't think there's really any any doubt about that. So that was a clear victory. We lost, geez, about 300 men plus. Let's take a look at the stats there and see how we did. Our Yasithas did some pretty big lifting in this fight, in this fight. But also notice the longbowmen uh, did actually got the most kills. I guess that's fairly understandable. Uh, they didn't take too many casualties either, as there were no dedicated enemy archers, so they were able to fire with impunity once we got them around to the flank. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, pretty even distribution of, of kills. Our, uh, our Yasithas unit, who, this is probably our general, uh, who, who did by far the most uh, melee damage of any other unit. That's kind of what you can expect. You get your spearmen to basically hold the line, but you're going to be doing the killing uh, with your family members. And so it all feels very period accurate. So let's see what the public order looks like here once we've taken over this place. Not too bad. We've got the options here of just occupying the settlement. We could forcibly resettle them. Uh, to uh, This works just the, uh, the way enslaving works in the vanilla Rome Total War or Barbarian Invasion. You distribute a certain proportion of population to those settlements that do have governors in them. Uh, or we could pillage and burn the place. Just get rid of, uh, succumb or and or disperse, as the mod puts it. Uh, so that'd be a, a quick cash injection as well as a decent uh, insulation against any public order problems. Let's go with forcibly resettling. I feel like we could use the population. A 
It's spring of a new year. We've got a candidate for adoption. We did lose a couple of guys in that fight, but they went down like heroes as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he's a 29-year-old, confident in defense, untouched by fear, good ambusher, and pagan. Okay, so we should mention this. You know, some people may be expecting you know, individuals to have more religious variety, but I think this is the way to go. Instead of having the religion mechanic in Barbarian Invasion used for things like like what, Woden worship versus Thor worship? That would just be weird. Uh, we've got instead sedentary versus migratory, and uh, it's understood that all of these guys have various allegiances to the various uh, forms of, of Norse paganism. So he is a follower of the old ways and the old gods, and that gives plus 5% sedentary conversion. So one way you can overcome some of the problems of the migratory religion creeping into your settlements throughout the years is by stacking your realms with various uh, various men who have this, this pagan attribute. I think we'll go ahead and take him. We need some more, more fighter types. And so since we've taken this settlement, there are some buildings here that are just destroyed. And so we would need to repair those. The cost is not too bad, honestly, given the amount of money we have. And so it's not going to be too onerous, but it is something we're, we're going to have to do. Otherwise, we do get only a couple of options for recruitment. Uh, we're going to have to wait for the repair of those other buildings before we can get our military up and running. Uh, but we could train boats or large boats. The only difference basically being uh, minor bonuses to stats, but really the, uh, the number of soldiers and the upkeep costs are, of course, going to be commensurate. This is not, of course, uh, a mod that is heavily focused on naval warfare per se, but you're definitely going to want something of a naval presence. Uh, it's really difficult to command the seas. There's just simply so much ground uh, or water, so to speak, that you can't cover all of it, but you can strategically use your ships to ferry men back and forth to control choke points, uh, such as you know these, these passages, these riverways, and uh, deny that to your enemy to, to a certain extent. Ah, we've got an agent found at uh, Allingstead. This is our capital. And so let's take a look at this guy. Okay, I guess he's, uh, yes, a Frisian spy. We don't know his traits, but we know for sure that what he's going to be doing is causing migratory unrest. Uh, let's see, we've got an Erla diplomat. I don't, I guess we can't see his traits either. Uh, but if we take a look at Allingstead, we can see that we're getting some migratory uh, impulse here from different characters in the region. And so that is no doubt due to those enemy agents. That's going to be causing problems as the seasons change, as migratory religion becomes much more attractive. Um, as it is currently, look at all this public order. Because, of course, it's spring. Time for guys to go off and be raiding and not necessarily hanging around uh, the towns or your settlements just looking for ways to serve you. So again, different things to manage in the mod. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this look. It's a, albeit a short one at Scanza Total War. Definitely worth a shot uh, over on ModDB to check it out. Uh, Dance Viking is, is fairly committed to this period, and it really shows. And I think he has plans for maybe expanding the scope of the mod to some extent. For now, though, I'm just happy to see that we've got this really tight, focused mod on this period with some interesting mechanics that help uh, improve the atmosphere, help make you feel like you're really having to deal with uh, the ebb and flow of migratory populations during this age of migration. Let me know what you think if you've given the mod a shot. How have you found it? What factions have you enjoyed? Uh, until the next video, take care.